Welcome to the Blue Mountains Public Library. I'm Elizabeth McCollum and a member of the library's Arts and Culture Council, a group of volunteers who organize art exhibits and presentations in the gallery. COVID restrictions have caused us to reorganize in order to continue with our programs and shows. Online has helped us to keep going. More presentations are being planned for the winter spring season. This program, Waterfalls in the Beaver Valley and Area, is a presentation by Stu Hiltz. Dr. Hiltz is a retired professor from the University of Guelph in the School of Environmental Sciences. In his long tenure there, he was involved in developing programs to encourage private landowners in rural southern Ontario to conserve natural areas such as woodlands and wetlands on their properties. In teaching, he loved field work with his students, getting out especially to the Beaver Valley. In retirement, he was able to devote more time to the Bruce Trail Conservancy, sharing his expertise in land stewardship. As a leader of slowpoke hikes, Stu's pace encouraged frequent stops so hikers could observe and absorb his knowledge of nature on the trail. Therefore, Stu, as a person very familiar with the Beaver Valley, will focus in this presentation on the beauty of its waterfalls. Welcome, Stu. So welcome to this presentation on the waterfalls of the Beaver Valley and Owen Sound region. I'm Stu Hiltz, and I wanna thank Liz for that nice introduction and the Arts and Culture Committee for inviting me to do this. It's my first attempt at a Zoom presentation, so I hope you enjoy it. You see in front of you a rather distinguished looking older gentleman I'm trying to phrase that nicely, sitting in a wheelchair, looking a little bald, but I was not in a wheelchair until recently. So I was out exploring around the Beaver Valley for 30 years or so. I first brought students up from the University of Guelph on a field course for 20 years. And then we retired to the valley near the Beaver Valley Ski Club. And I took up hiking, exploring, and photography. So I've accumulated some nice pictures of the waterfalls in the region, and I hope you enjoy them. We actually have one of the best collections of waterfalls here in the Beaver Valley and Sound area in the entire province, and they're pretty unique. So I hope you learn something from this presentation. Now let's get started. I started out with waterfalls in the Beaver Valley, but then I realized the waterfalls around Own Sound are pretty unique too, so I made it the Beaver Valley area. That's Eugenia Falls. I'm not putting titles on all of them, so you can guess which ones the pictures are as we go through if you've been to many of these. I want to try and take you beyond the pretty pictures of waterfalls, although there are lots of those and look at some of the underlying things that make them interesting. The big one is geology, because we have two very different types of waterfalls here in the valley. And you have to understand the geology to recognize that. As you can see at Eugenia Falls, the layer it's falling over, the layer of rock is a great big blocky layer with thick blocks of rock. I'm also going to talk briefly about the history associated with some of these waterfalls, seasonal change, some secret waterfalls, and um, a brief comment on photography of waterfalls. So when we look at geology, the top layer, as I said, is that great big thick Amabel dolomite. It's a hardened version of limestone that doesn't erode very easily at all. 
And that's what forms the big cliff of the Niagara Scarp. We've also got some really interesting history, of particular waterfalls. So I'll come back to that. Chasing waterfalls in different seasons in the winter particularly is really fascinating. This is Indian Falls, northwest of Own Sound a few years back when it froze extensively. And of course, Inglis Falls in Own Sound. This is one of my many attempts to take those misty, blurry pictures of water falling, which is a tricky thing to do. So let's start with the ge geology. We're used to that big limestone cliff or Dollarstone Cliff all the way from Niagara Falls to Hobermory. And the, the usual image is that it's one big cliff, but it's actually two in the valley. From about Blue Mountain over to north of Owen Sound, the two layers separate a little bit, quite a bit in some locations, because the Manitoulin Dollarstone, the lower layer of Dollarstone, is thicker and more obvious here than elsewhere. So we often have that Amabel Dollarstone separately as the main escarpment you see, and then a gap of anything up to two or three kilometers before you go over the smaller Manitoulin Dollarstone scarp. And it's often buried under glacial debris so that you don't actually see it except where the waterfalls are. So let's start from the top. The big waterfalls, I showed you Eugenia Falls a few minutes ago. This is in the winter. Fall over that top layer of Amabel Dolomite. This is Hogs Falls. If you've ever been to it, you'll recognize it. It's a little difficult to get down in the bottom of the gorge to take a picture like this, but it's a beautiful waterfalls. Uh, Walters Falls, in Walters Falls. It's also difficult to get down to the valley bottom here, but our photography group did it a few years ago. There's lots of interesting history here. Jones Falls at the northwest corner of Old Sound. Very easy to get to, but not many people seem to know its exact location or which trail to take. And of course, Inglis Falls in Old Sound. Those are the big waterfalls we know about, most people know about, and they fall over that top layer of the escarpment dolomite. When we look at that top layer, and we'll look at the other layers soon, we, we need to remember that it's not as solid as it looks. It's filled with both crevices and sinkholes. So water can actually percolate through that dolostone and let me show you a few places. Here are some two of the crevices in the Amabel Dollarstone. The remarkable narrow crevices on the left are just southeast of Owen Sound, and that's the Bruce Trail going straight through that narrow crevice and up those steps. On the right, the crevices is over in the southern part of the Beaver Valley. There are also a lot of sinkholes depressions where water has found its way through into cracks in the limestone below and drains away the surface, sometimes creating a big depression in a field like this. This diagram from the geology and landforms of Gray and Bruce counties might help to explain how this all happens. Often you have a barrier along the edge of the escarpment that stops the water. That's the case on both sides of the lower Beaver Valley. It's not so obvious in the Own Sound area, but water will find its way through cracks in the limestone and down through that Amabel Dolomite to come out as a spring lower down. And those springs become important. If there are no gaps like that to allow sinkholes to form, that's where we get the waterfalls over the top layer. This is the, the uh, Lined Valley 
of the Wodehouse Karst. The Wodehouse Creek flows in here. You can see a bit of the creek on the left. In the, the dark area on the lower right are some of the sinkholes where the water drains directly into the limestone. And in the background on the left is the final sinkhole, this one where any water left in the creek drains away. We'll look at the spring where they come out later on. This is a dry sinkhole where there is no creek, but there's underground drainage. And the soil on the surface is falling down into that underground stream. So let's go back to the geology here and talk about the next layer. When the water drains down through the Amabel Dolostone, it bumps into the Cabot Head Shale. Shale is a formation that has very tiny, densely packed particles, so water can't get through it at all. And it's forced to run out sideways, forming springs. So we're going to look at some of those now. On the upper left are the springs, called Kimberly Springs, where that Woodhouse Karst flows out. A, a huge spring, considering the amount of water pouring out of the ground here. And this is the creek on the right, just 100 yards further down. Below the springs, it's known as Bill's Creek. Above the springs and the sinkhole, it's known as Woodhouse Creek. On the left is another smaller spring in the middle of Kimberly Forest. I'm actually standing on the Bruce Trail when I took this picture. And on the right is another little stream below a spring where the old Smoky Ski Club was. Below that, we hit the second Dollastone Formation. This is very different from the top Amabel Formation. If you look at the upper half of the rock here, you'll see it's in mostly thin, flat layers. It looks different. And below that is first the blue and then the red of the Queenston Shale. So the water has poured over the Cabot Head Formation and come out in springs forming a creek that drains over this waterfall. You can see the little bit of red at the very base of the waterfall that is the typical color of the Queenston Shale. This is the Waterfalls by Pinnacle Rock, which is very similar, although the water is hiding the rock a little bit here. It's the same very thin layers. This tiny waterfalls that's only two or three feet wide in the Sly property really illustrates those thin layers of the Manitoulin Formation, perfectly flat, uh, really well. In own sound, Weaver Creek Falls is flowing over this same formation, although you can't get really close to it because it's on private property. You can see it from the trail in Harrison Park. And Indian Falls is the biggest and best example of this formation. You can see um, to the left of the waterfall here, the limestone layer that forms the top half, the Manitoulin formation, and then the Queenston Shale, first a blue and then a reddish layer down below. These waterfalls are almost always of this general shape, a flat landscape on the flat limestone, and a bowl-shaped depression in the rock as the waterfalls blows over. Kiefer Creek Falls is one that's very similar, but you may not know about it because it's not publicized much and it's on private property. You have to know where it is to go and find it. And there, I photographed these very thin, flat layers of the Manitoulin Formation again. This is the falls at the end of the Stuhilt side trail on the, on the Bruce Trail just north of Hogs Falls a ways. The top half is the limestone, and the bottom half again is the Queenston Shale in bluish gray and reddish colors. And there's one place where we have a double waterfall. 
on Bowles Hill, where the Bruce Trail goes south from Bowles Hill. You will see a waterfalls high up the hill above you, below that, that ski chalet, tumbling down over the talus slope and then dropping again over the second limestone formation on the right. Although in this case, it's all covered with growth of moss, so you don't see the rock very much. So that's the end of the story on geology. I hope you learn to recognize those two different geological formations and realize that the, the waterfalls in the Beaver Valley and Home Sound areas are quite different from each other sometimes. Now let's go on and talk about history a little bit. I want to talk about uh, Eugenia Falls briefly as one of the historical places. You're probably aware that there was a gold rush here in 1852 when settlement was just getting started at the very beginning of settlement when someone spotted some rock that looked like it was glittering gold color. Word got out and soon the falls was overwhelmed with miners hoping to get rich quick. And then a report came back when the first samples had been sent in and it turned out to be fool's gold. So it was a three week gold rush that dried up quick and made nobody rich at all. But in a very short time, there were four mills on this river, most of them below the waterfalls here, grist mills, sawmills, and the river has been used for milling and generating power ever since. Big Power Station was built in 1914 when they built a dam above Eugenia Falls forming Eugenia Lake and put two big, at first wooden, now steel pipes running a couple of kilometers to the north over the edge of the escarpment down to the powerhouse below. But there had been an attempt build a tunnel through the bedrock north of the falls. This is all that remains at both ends of the tunnel, the limestone gate, so to speak, into the tunnel. The tunnel itself has been filled in for safety reasons many years ago. But this was how they hoped initially to build a power plant. It didn't work and they ended up building the one that exists today which is, by the way, the highest drop in a power plant east of the Rockies in Canada, and is still providing a substantial contribution to Ontario's hydro in this region. The Inglis Falls Grist Mill is probably well known to many of you, and there is one building above the falls remaining on the far side of the bridge, see it in this picture and there is one small building remaining at the foundation of the falls well you can't see it here this was a mill illustrated in the the painting on the right hand side of this picture that my great grandfather took his grain to to be ground he farmed just outside the village of Kilsyth, about four miles to the west and he carried the sacks of grain to the Inglis Falls Mill to get his flour to take back home. So it seems of personal interest to me. The main picture there is the part of the mill that showed above the falls where the current um, open patch of grass is across from the parking area. The picture in the circle is the view of the song of the grist mill from below the falls. The left hand picture is a different location, a bit of old mill machinery that's left below Webwood Falls where there was also a small mill. At Hogs Falls there was an attempt to build a power station. All that remains of that is a uh, bit of old cement wall from the dam above the falls trying to create a higher drop of water. 
And at Walters Falls, we have two very interesting mills. This is part of the old sawmill. That's the mill that burnt down fairly recently in 1984, I think it was. And it used this small mill dam in the waterfalls to provide power. This building is just a storage building that was saved when the main mill burned. The main mill sat where the parking lot is today. And then the family built a new sawmill uh, out on the highway, no longer dependent on water power. So you can still get lumber and wood chips there. And, and the family also built the hotel, the Walters Falls Inn. Just upstream from the sawmill is a grist mill that, that is still operating with water power. It is, it claims to be the only grist mill still grinding grain using water power. There's quite a big mill down further upstream, south of the village, a long pipe carrying the water into the mill. And you can stop and go in because they have a store. Standing in the entrance of that old mill, you can feel the thumping as the big wheels go around and the, and the grain gets ground. Uh, sorry, I don't have a picture of that one. To go on from history, I've also found the seasonal change that goes on at Waterfalls really interesting. This is Eugenia Falls and the water looks like it froze where it was dropping. A slight bluish color sometimes. Eugenia Falls is a bit hard to get a picture of because it's not easy getting down below the falls at all. But you can get some interesting pictures from above. Besides winter, in spring on the left, there tends to be quite a lot of water flowing over the falls. But remember that this, the bulk of water now flows through the tunnels to the power plant. In summer, late summer, the waterfalls on the right can dry up to a small trickle. And this was the waterfalls on April 1st, 2016, the big flood, most recent flood anyway. The water was absolutely thundering over the falls. I, I imagine it must be looking like it used to look before the power plant in the spring. The flooding was so bad, a series of severe rainstorms, that Eugenia Lake threatened to overflow and they had opened the floodgates at the dam, letting the water out, protecting Eugenia Lake. But then it flooded in the valley down below where the river went charging down the valley. So not everyone was happy, but it sure made for a good photograph. I presume you can recognize this waterfalls, Inglis Falls in the winter, about half frozen over. You get some remarkably interesting ice formations around the waterfalls in a cold January. One year recently, when we had a long period of cold temperatures and a fair bit of snow, the river below Indian Falls froze over. Just a few little patches of water were still open. And people started hiking up the valley to see the falls from below. Normally the trail goes up a set of stairs and you see the falls from above. After we saw the pictures in the local newspapers of this pile of snow here in front of the waterfalls, covered with 30 or 40 people, we walked up there ourselves and managed to find a moment when there weren't any people and got this picture. So remarkable number of icicles on the right hand side, a huge amount of ice in the foreground, and there's the waterfalls on the back left. That site you won't see very often. 
And this site was that little waterfalls at the end of the Stewhill side trail. It doesn't have a name, but it's a beautiful little falls. In fact, this was my first trip in to see the falls. The Bruce Trail goes along the top of that limestone cliff there on the right and heads north. And you can see the stream flowing over the edge, but you can't see the waterfalls. So one winter I got my snowshoes on and, and tramped down below the falls, down a very steep slope to look at what it looked like in the winter. And it looked quite beautiful in the winter. That was the start of the side trail. Since I was the stewardship coordinator for the local Bruce Trail Club and the Bruce Trail owns this property, I was exploring to see if a side trail that showed the falls would be worthwhile. And you can now hike a loop on this property that goes down past the waterfall and up over a lookout at the top and back to your car. Then there are the secret waterfalls. And I use the term secret waterfalls. Maybe I should call them ephemeral waterfalls. These are waterfalls that only exist for a few weeks in the spring. The one on the left-hand side is along the Bruce Trail, off the seventh line. The one on the right-hand side is along the Bruce Trail, just northeast of Woodford. These are cases where there are sinkholes above, and normally, for most of the year, the water drains down through that sinkhole and out in springs at the base of the hill, leaving no waterfall no water flowing over the falls. But for a brief time in the spring, sometimes as short as one week, the water will flow down these falls. So you have to know exactly when to get in there and take a photo. As you can see on the right, the snow was still lying on the ground in late April when I got that picture. This is the waterfalls you won't see. At the Beaver Valley Ski Club, the Woodhouse Karst overflows in the spring or during a really bad January thaw. There's then a creek below the sinkholes that flows toward the Beaver Valley Ski Club and flows over the edge of the cliff in between two ski chalets. You can see it if you drive in to Windy Lane at the top of the Beaver Valley Ski Club. But it only flows for, if it's a January thaw, perhaps a week or two. If it's the spring thaw, you get a lake up above the sinkholes and the waterfalls might last for a good three weeks. The left-hand picture is the waterfalls during a January thaw where it's confined in behind the limestone of the cliff. The, the picture on the right is the spring thaw where the waterfalls was a thundering volume of water that didn't even allow me to get close to take a better picture. Finally, a few comments on photography. This is looking down at Webwood Falls from the viewing platform that the Bruce Trail has now built on the north side of the falls. And you can see I, I think I was actually getting fairly good at capturing that misty waterfall look in this picture. It took me a few years to get there. If you're going to try and do that, there are quite a few things you have to understand and be willing to adjust. It really means that you have to be capable of getting off your automatic setting on a good camera and be able to set your camera to aperture mode or, or uh, the speed control. In this case, you have to have a slow speed to allow time for the water to fall the way it looks. But if you slow down the speed, perhaps to a quarter second exposure, more light gets in. 
So to compensate for that, you have to have a small aperture. It helps to have the ISO rating set as low as possible and to use a tripod because once it's at a slow speed, you won't be able to hold it steady with your hands. And if that's still not enough, you might need a neutral density filter, which is a filter that simply blocks light. So it makes the photo darker than you expect and it helps you get the right light setting. A lot of experimentation might be necessary. Dull days are better than sunny days for getting these sorts of pictures. So that photo on the left is another photo of slowed down. That's actually a piece of Eugene of uh, Jones Falls, obviously taken on a tripod, and I think it worked out fairly well. The right-hand picture is a tiny piece of Inglis Falls where I, I shot at a fast speed and was trying to actually stop the water. I don't think I quite stopped it, but almost. So that's the difference. Learning to do that sort of photography is probably another entire presentation in itself. So I'd like to conclude by just suggesting you get out and enjoy these, enjoy these waterfalls in this region. There are lots of them to go and see. Most of them are easy to get to. Some of them you can get down below safely and you'll have lots of opportunity for photography. So thank you very much. On behalf of the Arts and Culture Council, thank you, Stu, for your virtual presentation, bringing us closer to the beautiful waterfalls in the Beaver Valley and area. We appreciate the time and effort you have given to developing this program. Your close attention through your photography and background information detailed these waterfalls in their natural beauty. Thank you. Continue to watch on the Blue Mountain Public Library calendar site for further presentations. Two are being planned for the month of March. Thank you. <laughs>